Community ecology deals with different species living in the same geographic area. Our definition of community is an assemblage of populations of various species living close enough for potential interaction. These can be positive interactions, negative interactions, or neutral interactions. On this caterpillar, we can see a number of different interactions that are happening between um, the parasitic wasp larva and the um, caterpillar, as well as between the caterpillar and the plant. When you have a relationship between species, so two separate species are interacting, we call that an interspecific interaction. Examples of these are competition, predation, herbivory, as well as any symbiosis such as parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism, which we're going to go into detail in just a little bit. Um, they can affect their survival and reproduction of each species that are involved in that interaction, and the effects can either be positive for the individual, they can be negative, or have no effect at all. Interspecific competition is a negative-negative interaction. That means both species that are engaged in competition do not benefit. Both are harmed by that. And typically we see this when you have uh, members of the same species competing for a resource in short supply. Um, whenever there's competition, it is um, harmful to both individuals involved in that competition. Because there always has to be a winner and there has to be a loser. And uh, that means that there's not enough resources for both. There are two central concepts that um, we can gauge interspecific competition by, and the first is the competitive exclusion principle. This means you have two species vying for the same resource. The one that is slightly more fit or has a slight reproductive advantage is going to eliminate the other. Um, they cannot be in the same place at the same time going for the same resources. One of those three things has to be alleviated for them to not be in direct competition with each other. The second thing we um, think about when we talk about interspecific competition is an ecological niche. This is the total of the biotic and abiotic resources, so both the living and the non-living resources a species uses in its environment. And when we talk about niches, there is both a fundamental niche and a realized niche. So here's an example of um, the competitive exclusion principle. In this diagram, we can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different um, species of lizards all living in the same general area. The reason that these guys can live in the same area is because they're utilizing different parts of the tree. So they may be going for the same resource, at the same time, but because they're in different parts of the tree, they've alleviated the direct competition between the species. Um, this is called resource partitioning. And what you're doing is you're changing the ecological niche just slightly so that they're not in direct competition with one another. In a realized versus a fundamental niche, um, we see what area an organism would occupy if it didn't have competition, that's the uh, fundamental niche, versus what space it actually occupies, which is the realized niche. So in this particular example, I believe we have barnacles, um, and your thalamus uh, barnacles versus your balanus barnacles um, both have a realized niche, and we see that the Cathalmus barnacles are much higher up on the rocks and the balanus are lower. If we were to remove this entire species, you notice that the cathalmus cover the entire rock. Um, this is our fundamental niche. So if they didn't have competition with the other type of barnacle, they would cover a lot larger area. But because of competition, they have a much smaller area um, that they actually reside in. In predation, you have one organism that is benefiting from the interaction, usually the predator, and one organism that is being harmed in the inter interaction, which is typically your prey. So in this particular example, one organism will kill and eat the other. There are a lot of feeding adaptations of predators so that they're more effective at killing prey. That include claws, teeth, fangs, stingers, poison, um, all of those help them to be more effective. But the prey also have defenses, whether they are behavioral defenses or adaptations such as hiding and fleeing or forming herds or schools whenever a predator is around. Um, there are self-defense mechanisms, alarm calls, all of those prevent the predator from eating the prey. So as they evolve together, they tend to get um, 
mechanisms that they both use to try to get the upper hand on the other. Here's some examples of how organisms avoid predation. In cryptic coloration, you can hardly see this canyon tree frog that's blending in with its environment. The camouflage makes the prey really difficult to spot. The complete opposite defense mechanism is aposmatic coloring. In this poison dart frog, we have really bright coloring. There's no blending in with the environment, and what this does to the predator is it warns that it has a chemical defense. It is poisonous, do not eat me. Um, so those are two completely different approaches to avoid predation. In Batesian mimicry, you have a harmless species, such as the hawk moth larva, that is mimicking an unpalatable or a harmful species, such as the green parrot snake. This is actually the back end of the larva, and it puffs up whenever it's in danger, and the coloration makes it look like eyes of the green parrot snake. So um, the predator is going to stay away, thinking it is in fact a snake, another predator, rather than the prey it's looking for. In malarian mimicry, two unpalatable species mimic each other. So here we have the cuckoo bee and the yellow jacket. Both of them are unpalatable, both of them are poisonous to their predators, um, and in this case they've both been selected for their bright coloration. Um, this is helpful for the predator because it only has to remember that yellow and black stripes are what are unpalatable and to stay away from both of those. In herbivory, this is a lot like predation. You have one organism that is being benefited from the interaction, and you have one organism that is being harmed. So the organism that is benefiting is the herbivore, and the one that is um, not benefiting is usually plant or algae. And again, just like in a predator-prey relationship, you have um, plant, mechanical, and chemical defenses um, that protect it against herbivores. So a plant could be toxic, um, it could have caffeine in it, which uh, is an insecticide. It could have spines on it, like a cactus. Um, and herbivores also have defenses that allow them to get around the plant defenses. Perhaps they are um, immune to the toxin or the poison, whatever the case may be. Symbiosis is where two organisms um, live in direct and intimate contact with one another. The three types are parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. In parasitism, one organism is benefiting and one organism is being harmed. The parasite will typically take nutrients from the host, so the parasite is the organism that is benefiting, um, and the host is not getting all of its nutrients and is therefore harmed in the process. A lot of parasites have two-part, very complex life cycles where they need two different organisms in order to complete their life cycle, um, and they are very much adapted to the organism that they are parasites in. They cannot live without those two organisms. Some parasites will even change the behavior of the host to increase their own fitness. If you get a chance, I highly encourage you to go on YouTube and look up um, parasitic wasps and see what interaction they have and, and what their life cycle is like. It is completely disgusting. Mutualistic symbiosis is a beneficial relationship for both organisms involved. So both of them are benefiting in some way. An example of this is the acacia tree and the ants that live on the acacia tree. The acacia tree gives the ants glucose and sugars, food that it needs. In exchange for that, the plant or the ants will um, attack any herbivore that comes by, as well as it will clear out the ground around um, the tree so that no other plants can grow there and take nutrients from the acacia tree. So both organisms are benefiting from that relationship and that direct interaction. In commensalism, and this one is the hardest one to prove, you have one organism that's being benefited, and the other organism is neither harmed nor benefited. It is completely unaffected. And this one is truly hard to show because we don't know for sure that they're not gaining some benefit from the reaction, the interaction. An example of this are the Cape Buffalo and the egrets. I believe those are egrets that are on top of them. Um, the Cape Buffalo are neither harmed nor benefited from having the birds around, but the birds are able to eat insects off of the um, Cape Buffalo. Species diversity is a really important part of ecology. It is the community and the variety of organisms that make up the community. We have two types of ways we classify species diversity. We classify it by species richness, so the total number of different species in the community, and we have relative abundance, so what proportion do we have each species in the total community?
This is a great diagram to show us species richness and relative abundance. In both Community 1 and Community 2, we have the same species richness. We have four different species in Community 1, and we have four different species in Community 2. Where they're different is the relative abundance. In Community 1, we have an equal abundance of each, um, each type of species of tree. In Community 2, uh, the most abundant tree is this tree right here at 80%. So the abundance is very different in these two communities, even though the species richness is the same. So we would consider um, this forest to be more diverse. It has greater relative abundance of all species and, um, well, since species richness is the same, that doesn't really play a role in this. All right, other things you need to know for community structures are the trophic structure, and trophic means food or feeding, and that's relationships between your organisms in the community and what they eat, how they eat, where they eat. So food chains are a simple one-line lineage, and the arrow points to who eats that organism. So here we have a plant that is eaten by a grasshopper, which is eaten by a mouse, rat looking thing, which is eaten by a snake, which is eaten by a uh, bird of prey. Food chain is one link from the um, primary producer to the um, quaternary consumer. And then typically you don't have um, organisms that only eat one type of food. How we like to show um, the complex food interactions is with a food web. So we can see here that um, phytoplankton are eaten by both krill and these copepods um, and we see all the different organisms that are eaten and then we can also look at if we were to take out phytoplankton how does that affect the rest of the community so we get to see a better um, idea of what the community structure is in terms of energy transfer dominant species are those that have the most abundant or have the highest biomass the total mass biomass is just total mass of all individuals in a population these guys exert really powerful control over the occurrence and distribution of other species. So typically, the lower you are in the food chain, the larger um, your biomass is. So that tends to be the most um, dominant species tend to be plants. Invasive species are introduced to a new area. Um, typically, it's us humans. We like plants, and we want to bring them to our homes, and they're not necessarily native. And when you bring in an invasive species, they don't have predators, they don't have disease, they don't have all of those competitive factors that they had in their past community, and they tend to run wild. They tend to spread and overpopulate, and they also will um, edge out native species. Keystone species will exert a strong control in a community by their ecological roles or their niche. So they are similar to dominant species in that they play a really important role in a community, but they're not necessarily the most abundant. They don't have the biggest biomass in that community, but they play a very powerful role. In this example, we have sea otter populations and what effect they have on their specific food chains. So we're just looking at a chain, not necessarily an entire web. Kelp is eaten by urchins, is eaten by um, sea otters, is eaten by orca whales. Here we see the otter um, number is very high. When that number is high, our sea urchin biomass is low, meaning the otters eat all of the urchins um, and we don't have any kelp. If we were to wipe out the sea otters, so there are no sea otters, we see kelp makes a comeback and you have sea urchins that are eating the kelp. When you reintroduce the sea otters, you lose, once again, you lose these two species. So otters tend to be a keystone species. They have a dramatic effect on the other organisms in the community. Disturbances are events that change the community. They can remove organisms and alter the resource availability. Examples of disturbances can be storms, fires, floods, drought. Human activity is a big disturbance. Um, fire is the most significant disturbance that you're going to see in most terrestrial ecosystems. That's the one that tends to come through the most. According to the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, um, Ecosystems need a moderate level of disturbance in order to have a higher diversity of species. So every so often you do need a forest fire coming through and clearing the way, altering the resource availability and changing what the land looks like. If you are to suppress something like a disturbance, you tend to get a lot lower species richness and species abundance and therefore a much lower diversity of organisms in a particular area. 
this graph just shows um, your levels of intensity. So on this end we don't have a very intense disturbance and on this end we have very intense disturbances. Number of taxa or the diversity of your area is highest when you have a moderate level of disturbance. Not too few, not too much. Succession is a sequence of community and ecosystem changes after disturbance. There's primary succession, which um, after this particular succession, you have no soil existing, so you're back to rock. Um, the two examples of this is if a volcano were to erupt, you'd be left with lava, and there'd be no soil, and the soil would have to break down before plants could come in, and plants would have to grow before you get your larger organisms. Um, in secondary succession, you, oh, another example of primary succession is um, glacial retreat. So as a glacier moves through, it just leaves rocks behind and no soil. In secondary succession, this happens after an area, um, or it begins in an area where the soil remains after disturbance. So if you think of a forest fire or a hurricane or a tornado, um, the soil is still intact. Um, so the succession coming back to a climax community is a lot shorter in secondary succession because your soil is already there than it is in primary succession. <clears throat> Two biogeographic contributions are really important for community diversity. The first is the latitude that your community is in. Plant and animal life are generally more abundant and diverse right around the tropics. Um, and less so as you move up towards the poles and a good reason for this is because the seasons tend to be um, pretty similar throughout. You have a rainy season and you have a drier season. Uh, you don't get these uh, huge changes between your seasons like we do in Colorado where it's very very cold and very very warm in the summer. Also the area of the community or the size of the community will affect um, how many species it has. So the larger your area, the more diverse it tends to be in terms of species. The equilibrium model of island biogeography maintains that species richness on an ecological island levels off at a dynamic equilibrium point. So there's a point where you aren't going to get any more rich depending upon how big your island is or how far it is away from the mainland. So the rate of immigration and extinction are influenced by not only the size of the island, so how large is the area, but also the distance your island is from the mainland. So if you were to increase the size of the island, you're going to increase the rate of immigration. There's more room, there's more resources available, and you also decrease extinction. As you increase the distance from the mainland, you also uh, decrease the rate of immigration. So less animals are able to travel from the mainland to the island because the distance is increasing. Once the rate of immigration decreases, extinction starts to increase as well. And this diagram just shows species richness on the Galapagos Islands. So here we have the equilibrium number on this particular island. So your immigration and your extinction rates, where they cross, gives you the number of species on a particular island. That's your magic number. On a smaller island, there is less area. You tend to have a smaller number of species diversity, so you have less species. When the island is bigger, you tend to have more species, so there is a higher species diversity. As the island is further, from the mainland you have less species and when it's closer to the mainland you have more species. 